Hi, this lesson is about versions of the Bible. Now, one thing that happens as soon as you start to read the Bible is you realize there are tons of different versions. You walk into a Bible bookstore to try to buy a Bible and there's shelf after shelf after shelf with all these different abbreviations like the NIV and the KJV and the NASV and the L NLT and you get confused and you start to wonder. There has been 450 different English translations of the Bible in the past 400 years. What I want to make sure I get clear to you right up front before we go any further is I want to assure you that no matter what version of the Bible you read, God's message of salvation comes through. Don't worry about which version of the Bible you have or which version of the Bible you go to buy. Well, so I'm going to talk a bit about why we have so many different versions of the Bible. You remember that there's two sections to the Bible. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament, the first 39 books of the Bible, come to us in Hebrew. The New Testament, the next 27 chapter of books of the Bible, are written in Greek. Now, you might say, well, why don't we just take the originals and translate them? How hard can it be? Well, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Because none of the original texts exist anymore. The, uh, the piece of animal skin that Isaiah wrote his prophecy on, or the uh, piece of papyrus paper that Paul wrote his letter on, they've become dust years ago. What we have is we have a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And to make things even more confusing, sometimes those copies are translated into a different language and then translated to a different language and then translated to English. So you can see that the process of translating the Bible is very complex. I want to talk a bit about just translation in general. For us to read this in English, we have to go from Hebrew to English and from Greek to English. Now when you translate a language to English, any language to English, there are certain words and certain phrases that sometimes don't come across very clear. So you have to make a judgment, you have to make a decision about the best way to express that word or that phrase. And different people might have different opinions about how it's done. Let me give you an example from what happened to me yesterday. Uh, I love Mexican food, as you can tell. And uh, my favorite Mexican restaurant is right next to our office. It's Don Cuco's Mexican restaurant. And I like to go in there probably once a week or so, and my favorite thing to get is a shrimp burrito. So I go in yesterday, and Juan, the waiter who often works with me, delivers my shrimp burrito, and I say, gracias. And Juan said, de nada. Now those of you who know anything about Spanish would know that I said, thank you. And he said, you're welcome. So if you were translating this story, you would put that Jeff said thank you and Juan said you're welcome. But did I really say that? Literally, gracias translates to grace. Donata translates to of nothing. So now you understand some of the complications when you start to translate the Bible from two different languages into another language. There's basically three different means of translation. The first one is a literal translation where you try to get exactly as possible the meaning of that word or that phrase. Obviously the most accurate, but sometimes a little bit cumbersome and hard to read. So let's give you a literal translation of my lunch yesterday. Jeff went into Don Cuco's Mexican restaurant and had a shrimp burrito. The waiter, Juan, delivered the burrito and Jeff said grace and Juan said of nothing. Now eventually, you'd, get, you'd work your way through what that meaning is. You know, grace, gracious, you know, thanks, thankfulness. And so he said thank you. Of nothing. It's, it's nothing. It's not important. Don't mention it. Uh, no problem. You know, he's saying, you're welcome. 
a little bit of effort, a little bit of thought, you'd understand exactly what the literal translation means. A dynamic equivalent translation keeps the facts, the history, the characters intact, but tries to tell the story in more of a way that's easy to understand in our language, in our time. So let's hear about the lunch in a dynamic equivalent. We're going to keep the facts the same. Jeff went to Don Cuco's Mexican restaurant, ordered a shrimp burrito from Juan, and he said, thank you, and Juan said, you're welcome. Right? Obviously, it's a much easier way for us to understand in our language today. A paraphrase translation doesn't really take into account, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel com uh, constricted by the words themselves. It just tries to get across the meaning, the idea behind those thoughts. So a paraphrase translation might say, uh, Jeff went to a Mexican restaurant, had a burrito, and thanked the polite waiter. Now the problem with a paraphrase translation is sometimes maybe some of those details that are left out for, for, to make it read nice, maybe some of those details are important. Remember in an earlier lesson, we talked about symbols and foreshadowing and signs. Well, maybe, maybe the fact that it was a shrimp burrito, you know, is going to play an important factor later on, like maybe I have a shellfish allergy, right? So, you know, some of these details that are left out in a paraphrase translation, translation might be important. The other, besides the ways of translating the Bible, we also have different types of Bibles. We have amplified texts, which basically expand what you have. And it takes several different uh, versions and options of saying the same thing and combines them together to give you a, a complete understanding. Now, of course, these are helpful, but they can be very long to read. We also have study Bibles, which are designed for studying. You know, where they provide you a lot of notes, they provide you maps, uh, timelines, cross-references to other, other uh, verses in the Bible. Let's take a look at all of these different ones. First, literal translations. The most popular, the, the most sold Bible in the world, the King James Translation. Well, it's the most sold because it was translated in 1611, almost 400 years ago, and there's been literally billions printed. The King James has two main drawbacks. First of all, it was written in 1611, and methinks they talketh different then than they do now. Secondly, there's been a lot of archaeological discoveries in the past hundred years that have unearthed texts that scholars used to help translate the Bible that obviously weren't available 400 years ago when they wrote the King James. But the great thing about the King James, it's the standard for Bible study. And there are literally thousands of Bible aids, Bible study aids available to you that are keyed off the King James Bible and the words that are found in there. Another popular literal translation is the New American Standard Version written quite a bit later than the King James Bible, so it maintains that literal, that exact approach to translation, but tries to be a little bit more current in its wording. If you want to get really literal, there's the interlinear Bible, which translates line by line, word by word, the original Hebrew and the original Greek. Take a look at a page from the interlinear Bible. Obviously, it's the most exact translation. It's also probably the hardest one in the world to read. And it says things like, in the beginning created God, heavens, earth. Well, you can probably figure out what it's saying, but it doesn't roll off the tongue. There's a couple other literal translations that aren't very popular as reading Bibles, but I want to tell you about them because they're interesting. There's a translation of the New Testament called the Peshitta. Now here's where it gets a little bit more confusing, as if it wasn't confusing enough. The New Testament, like I said, is written in Greek, but the, language, the common language that was used at the time of the writing of the New Testament 
was Aramaic. So there's a lot of texts, there's a lot of copies of the New Testament in Aramaic. So the Peshitta makes an English translation of the Aramaic text of the New Testament. Here's a good example. From the King James, in English, they determined, the people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? When they translated it from the Aramaic to English, they said, the people answered saying, You are crazy. Who wants to kill you? Reads pretty well, and it's a direct translation, but not from the Greek, from the Aramaic. There's a similar version of the Bible that's available for the Old Testament. It's called the Septuagint. In the third century, 70 Jewish scholars translated the Old Testament from the original Hebrew into Greek. That's been translated into English, and that is what's called the Septuagint. Look at this comparison between the King James, where it says, After this lived Job 140 years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died, being old and full of days. In the Septuagint, the same verse reads, And Job lived after his affliction 170 years. And all the years he lived were 240, and Job saw his sons and his sons' sons, the fourth generation, and Job died, an old man and full of days, and it is written that he will rise again with those whom the Lord raises up. So they're dealing with you know, a different set of texts, and they arrive at a different, thing, a different uh, end result. Now it's important also for you to remember that no matter what text is used, no matter what version you read, God manages things. God controls things so that the message you receive is the message that God intends you to receive. That even if you read a, a, a different translation like the Septuagint, you're still going to read in there the message of salvation and hope that God has for you. Let's take a look at some dynamic equivalents, equivalent translations. These are probably the ones that you're most familiar with. The NIV, the New International Version, is the best-selling Bible of our day. So in 2008, 2009, 2010, whatever year, the, the NIV is the most uh, widely sold version of the Bible. There's also the New English Bible. Dynamic translations are nice because they try to maintain the accuracy of the history and the characters, but they try to present the words in a, in a form that we're familiar with, a form that we're more comfortable with. Paraphrase translations, these are two of my favorite paraphrase translations, the New Living Translation and the Message Bible. Again, these are versions where they've taken and they've said, we're not going to be constrained by the actual uh, original word. We're going to try to understand what the meaning is and relay that meaning in words that are common to us today. But like I said, the, the, it's a little bit tricky when you start doing this because you don't know what things are missed. I'll give you a good example. Uh, I'll quote some Shakespeare for you. Um, Shakespeare wrote uh, in Twelfth Night, he said, if music is the food of love, then play on. I will eat to excess and in surfeiting die. And you're all looking at me with blank stares, like, what does that mean, right? Well, if we were to do a paraphrase of that, we might say, I'd love to hear another song. It's not quite the same, is it? You know? And, and in, that, in, in what, what Shakespeare was saying, is he's saying, if music was like food, I would eat till I'm stuffed and, and keep eating until I die. You know, he's really trying to express how much he loves music. And you sometimes lose that when you paraphrase and you lose some of the meaning of those messages. Here's the King James version of John 3.16, which you probably know, and the message version. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The message says, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why. So that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help 
to put the world right again. I don't want to say that the solution is to find some Bible in the middle. What I want you to open your mind to is that there really is no exact translation. There really is no simple answer. And the best answer I have for you is if you can afford more than one, buy more than one. Uh, an amplified Bible attempts to break both word meaning and context into account in order to accurately translate the original text from one language to another. The Amplified Bible does this through the use of explanatory alternate readings and amplifications to assist the reader in understanding what Scripture really says. Multiple English word equivalents to each key Hebrew and Greek word clarify and amplify meanings that may otherwise have been concealed by the traditional translation method. That's an amplified description of what an amplified Bible is. It's easier just to show you. Right? The King James said, For God so loved the world. The Amplified Bible says, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten, his unique son, so that whosoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him, shall not perish, come to destruction, be lost, but have eternal, have everlasting life. So you throw in all these alternate options, these alternate translations, to help give you a fuller sense of what the verse is trying to say. There's some really great study Bibles. If you have uh, the opportunity to, to look at a study Bible, uh, Schofield has written a study Bible based on the King James Bible. The NIV study Bible is very popular. Take a look at a page from a study Bible. Look at the depth of information that's available to you here. Now, did you notice that this part right here is the Bible? They could only fit two verses on the page. But they got a great map. They got you know, a great dictionary defining all of stuff. They've got a great introduction telling you what's going to be coming up in that chapter. Great references to other verses that those two verses lead you to. And then notes and footnotes and, and additional information to help you study the Bible. But it's important to remember, when you're reading a study Bible, the notes and, and the cross-references that that Bible is pointing you to wasn't written by God. It was written by men who, in their own wisdom and effort, tried to give you the best interpretation they had, but it's important for you to read it with some intelligence and some discerning and a clear mind of yourself, of your own. This uh, chart here, I think, is nice because it kind of helps to lay out some of the different versions of the Bible on a scale of being completely accurate and completely readable. Uh, down here, at the, at the height of accuracy, and as far from readability as you can find, is the interlinear Bible, where it has the direct correlation of the Hebrew word or the Greek word to the English word. And you proceed your way up through, through the, the King James and the NIV, to the Living Bible, the New Living Translation, the message at the other end. And like I said, it's not necessarily the safest thing for you just to buy one in the middle, you know. But if you can afford to, it's nice to read a Bible from that's a very accurate, a very exact translation, and then read another Bible that's more readable. I find that sometimes reading a paraphrase opens my mind up to new thoughts that I wouldn't have thought by getting stuck in the, the words, the, the exact translations. One last thing to keep in mind is the readability of the Bible you choose. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't have the same uh, high level of, of reading skills. And especially if you're reading with your children or with your family, it's important to remember that, that the King James Bible is about a 12th grade reading level. Whereas the New International Reader's Version is down at a third grade level. It's a great Bible to begin with young children. And a lot of the paraphrased versions, the, the Message, the uh, New Living Translation, about a fifth or sixth grade level. And the NIV, the New International Version, is here at an 8th grade level. Whatever version of the Bible you pick, whatever version you find yourself with and able to read, read it. God wants to speak to you through that Bible. God wants his message to come through to you.